sahana vavatu sahano punatu sahaviryam karavavai tejasvinavari tamas dumavid vishavahai Om Shanti 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 May Brahman protect us, may he guide us and give us strength and right understanding. May love and harmony be with us all. Om Peace, Peace, Peace. And good morning again. So I don't usually uh, lecture this much, but here I am again. Uh, and I've been asked to reminisce a little bit about my earliest memories of Trabuco. Uh, my parents started bringing me to Vedanta things around 1954 when I was only five. And so Trabuco was very new then, only uh, since this is the 75th anniversary. Uh, you can tell that I was uh, here about four or five years after it was uh, open. And I can remember uh, the Asim was around then and... Uh, Badrananda, of course, uh, they had different names then. It was uh, Len and Frankie. So, <laughs> and there was uh, another uh, gentleman named uh, uh, Critchfield. I can't think of his first name off the hand, but anyway, he became a Namananda, and he ended up going around to various centers. He spent time here, then he was in Hollywood, then he was in Atlanta, and he was in Chicago. So uh, he wasn't here all the time, like. Uh, uh, Badrananda and Asim, who were kind of the pillars. And then, oh, maybe 10 years after that, uh, Tadatmananda came, and uh, those three really were the anchors of this uh, facility for many, many years. But coming down in, in those early days, uh, just to give you a perspective of California, this facility looks a lot the same as it did back then. Southern California does not look at all the same. Uh, my father worked for the Disney Studios, and uh, Disneyland opened in 55. Uh, he'd originally, Disney thought he was going to have it in Burbank, but there was not enough room, so he decided to have it down here, and people thought he was nuts. Down there, who's going to go all that way? <laughs> and of course, uh, the population just uh, moved right along. But so when we would drive down uh, in those early years, uh, the new subdivisions were in places like Downey and Norwalk, all these signs for this kind of home and that kind of home, come see our new development and so forth. And then uh, it would get, uh, the, pop, the city would get thinner and thinner. And by the time you got through Santa Ana, it was orange groves. There's a reason it's called Orange County. <laughs> it was all orange groves from there on in. And uh, the freeway turned into a, just a two-lane highway. And uh, you turn off on El Toro, there was nothing there, except on the 4th of July, there'd be a fireworks stand selling fireworks. <laughs> but other than that, there was nothing. Then in 64, I think it was, uh, Leisure World sprang up uh, literally in the middle of nowhere. You thought, what on earth are they putting this here for? It was like there was nothing for miles. The brothers would have to do their shopping either in Laguna or if they had to do a major shopping, they would go all the way to Santa Ana. So uh, shopping was a, a big trip in those days. And I think I remember that they actually had their own gas pump on the property so that they <laughs> didn't have to worry about filling up way, way downtown somewhere. Uh, in the early days, they had, uh, at various times, they had a cow. Uh, and I remember Eddie Acebo taking me down to introduce me to the cow. Uh, they had chicken coops, and uh, Hollywood would get both milk and eggs from Trabuco in those days. Uh, I was, uh, as I said, a very uh, small kid when we first came, and I remember Swami Prabhavananda asking me to sit in his lap, <laughs> and I remember sitting next to him over in this corner during the 4th of July. When I got a little older, about 12 or so, uh, then they, uh, they would have me help with serving the refreshments, the uh, going around and pouring water and so forth and uh, serving the cakes. 
And uh, the shrine originally had three levels. Uh, there was a, a third level, you can probably still see kind of a, an indentation in the carpet where the third level was. And there was uh, an old pedal uh, organ, a reed organ, that sat in there. It might be still the same one that's now off to the side, but at that time it had a regular stand and, and uh, uh, you know, on a regular like a council. And my sister was a nun in Santa Barbara for uh, four or five years from 60 to 64. And the choir came down with a, a special uh, cantata piece for the 4th of July. And so my sister was the organist for them then. And so she remembers uh, playing on that and how challenging it was because it was practically pitch black. And I think somebody tripped on the cord, and then they really couldn't see, and the music fell on the floor. And it was she had quite a time. So, uh, as I said, my dad worked for the studios, and he had borrowing privileges. And in those days, of course, there uh, there was no TV up here or anything of that nature. Uh, so every once in a while, he would borrow a movie from Disney's and come down here and show it uh, to the monks. So. That was their entertainment every once in a while. Uh, the 4th of July was a great big celebration even back then. And uh, I, my mother was not into heavy philosophy, so she didn't attend Gerald Hurt's lecture, so I don't remember him, but I'm sure I saw him at these major events. And uh, the pond was still there. That was always a fun thing to see. And let's see, what else? Uh, Oh, Brahmananda Cottage went in in the late 60s, maybe finished in the early 70s. And uh, Swami Amovananda, who had spent most of his time in Hollywood, was brought down to help with that. And I think uh, Asim or Frank also was instrumental in building that. It was pretty much built by resident people. It wasn't, we didn't contract it out and have people come in. Uh, a lot of the work in those days was done uh, with the devotee and, and monks doing it. Uh, Live Oak Canyon was still as beautiful as it is today with the beautiful overhanging oaks. Um, but of course, El Toro was just a small little two-lane road. Uh, you can still, every once in a while, catch a glimpse of the uh, part of the old road uh, off to the, the north of the current road. Cook's Corner was still there and a, a landmark even in those days. So a lot of those things were still the same, but you would look out here and there was nothing. <laughs> There's no lake, there was no houses. You couldn't see anything but hills uh, for miles and miles. And of course you could, on clear days, you could see the ocean. Uh, so it was a beautiful and serene spot. Of course, the 4th of July was always rather busy, so it wasn't quite as serene as it would normally be. But you could still feel the lovely atmosphere, and especially in the temple, had a wonderful, or the uh, shrine, a lovely uh, atmosphere. When I was older uh, and beginning to teach school, I taught school for six years, I uh, came here on retreat a couple of times. And in those days, there were a couple of other uh, residents, uh, one who's still alive, Swami uh, Budananda, Jim Barnett. He now lives in Sedona, Arizona, and 95 years old. And Ganeshananda, who was a, a very congenial fellow. And so they were, uh, they were both very nice uh, monks. Uh, Budananda was one of these people that could do anything, just anything. Uh, he could paint pictures, he could uh, do music, he could do dances, he could r do lectures, he could write, he could do anything. So it's one of these phenomenal uh, people that could uh, uh, do anything you put in front of him. And he did a lot of the gardening and a lot of the uh, landscaping and so forth. Uh, that garden area has been here a long, long time and there was a garden area, I guess it's still there in back of the monastery, as I remember, right? That was, that was a seams little garden, yeah. yeah, it was a seams garden. So uh, that's pretty much uh, all of the memories that I can dredge up at the moment. Oh, there was a, a, a resident here for a long time, uh, Guru Das, Jack Schwartz, and he was an artist and a restorationist. He would uh, 
do like faux art where you'd make things look like it's something else, like you could make your walls look like they're made out of marble and things like that. And he was also a sculptor. And there's a sculpture of Holy Mother. I think it's still in, the, in your bookshop, and that was actually done by him. So, huh? No, it's in the bookshop, I think, unless you've moved it recently. Was it this one? Yeah, I don't know. <laughs> All right, so let me get this out of the way. Oh yes, the, yeah, uh, Budananda did. Yeah, that's interesting. Yeah, Swami Budananda did some things on the Shrine Trail, and uh, he did the Native American medicine wheel. And the Native Americans weren't really keen on Westerners doing things in Native American styles, but they came and met him and were so impressed. He became a pipe carrying member <laughs> of the uh, of the uh, Native Americans. So. Yeah, quite an interesting guy. He, he went to the snow mass conferences for decades, uh, an interfaith conference there. All right, so uh, we've got a, uh, an interesting agenda today. We're going to talk a, about Sri Ramakrishna and Shiva, and then we're going to have what's called a sound bath with the crystal bowls, and Alok is going to be our, our sound bath uh, uh, expert here. So... The reason we're talking about uh, Shiva and Ramakrishna is obvious because we just had the two celebrations for them back to back. They always come three to four days apart. And so it seemed appropriate to show some of the connections, which we don't talk about as much. We often talk about he who is Rama, he who is Krishna is born again as Ramakrishna. And we talk about him being the priest at the Kali temple and a great devotee of Mother Kali and so forth. But we also forget that there are a lot of Shiva connections. And of course, when you look at the image of Mother Kali, you see Shiva lying underneath Mother Kali. And Sri Ramakrishna would always remind us that Shiva and Shakti are inseparable. Uh, they are one, and you can't separate them. And so when you're worshiping one, you're really worshiping uh, the other. And of course, uh, any of you who have been to Dakshineshwar or read the gospel, you are aware that there are 12 Shiva temples on the same property as the, the main temple to Mother Kali. So uh, Sri Ramakrishna really, of course, as we know, blends so many different philosophical and religious traditions. And his two main teachers were the Bhairavi Brahmani and Totopuri. And so we hear about them. And the Bhairavi Brahmani taught him both tantric and Vaishnava worship practices. And now according to the Tantra, the ultimate reality is consciousness or chit, which is identical with sat, existence, and ananda, bliss. So that's sat, chit, ananda. And so the reality is thought of in that way and usually emphasizing the idea of all-pervading consciousness. And human beings are thus identical with this reality. We are one with this uh, chit, and we, though we are under the influence of maya, or illusion. So it's very similar to Advaita Vedanta. Sri Ramakrishna blended all these together so seamlessly that for us novices who aren't expert philosophers, we sometimes have trouble uh, even remembering that there are subtle distinctions between some of these philosophical schools. So uh, anyway, uh, so we're under this illusion of Maya and we take this apparent world to be real. It's a world of subject and object. We've split things up into uh, the ego self, I, that sees a plurality of things out there as objects. And in reality, it is all sat chit and we've forgotten that. So our spiritual goal is to rediscover that oneness of reality and our identity with it. So, <clears throat> This, uh, this philosophy is really almost indistinguishable whether you're talking about a Shakta philosophy or a Shaivite philosophy. Shakta philosophy means you worship an aspect of Shakti or the Divine Mother, and Shaivite philosophy is that you're worshiping Shiva. But it, it 
all the words come out the same. The descriptions uh, are very, very similar. So I'm going to read to you an English translation of a hymn to Shiva, which we chant in Hollywood every Monday morning, and make comments as to the, uh, what the hymn is alluding to here. It starts out, may, we uh, may my love fasten firm to him, to Lord Shiva, in whom visions of glories arise. May my love so luminous cling to him, cling to Shiva, who is utterly pure like the sky, who is the Lord of all, having no Lord over himself. Now this is interesting, uh, sort of a historical reference. Long time ago, it appears, although it's a little difficult to uh, exactly pin things down in ancient Hindu history, but it appears that there are, of course, many different deities representing different powers of nature. So you had uh, uh, Indra and Agni and uh, Vayu and uh, Rudra, and Rudra was just the, the storm god. It was just one of these many elemental deities, you could say. But with the influence of the, the Vedic culture, it appears that Rudra morphed into Shiva and became the symbol for the power that was behind all of these other elemental deities. So uh, he became the figurehead, you could say, for that uh, infinite consciousness, that Brahman that is all pervading and the power behind all of these other elemental deity powers. And so this him is emphasizing that he is the Lord of all here. May my luminous love be attached to Shiva. So this is emphasizing that if you uh, want to practice a devotional practice, uh, put, turn your devotion towards Lord Shiva, who is the, the Lord of all. And by doing so, you will realize that you are one with Shiva. Shiva always is aware that he is Satchitananda. We are Satchitananda and we're not aware of it, so we want to get back to that awareness. For by him is all delusion destroyed, in whom lordship is always and forever existent. May it be attached to him whose love is manifest. His embrace reveals within the heart infinity of being. I salute the mind having its support in Shiva. Of course, our minds are a part of the cosmic consciousness. And so our minds are uh, one with that, if we could realize it. So my mind has lost its foreseen perfection, but I salute the mind having its support in Shiva. That infinite consciousness is supporting uh, my mind. It has now assumed a strange form, deluded and misshapen. Past impressions swirl within the mind, just like a furious tempest. And of course, that uh, tells us the nature of our mind. The monkey mind tends to uh, roam around and get distracted. And that's why we don't realize our, our true nature, our true essence being infinite consciousness. Thus, the sense of I and thou, that ob subject-object relationship, send endless waves through the mind. That's why we uh, have all these waves in our mind, is that we're trapped in this subject-object duality. I worship Shiva in whom countless forms become real, as our thoughts and our impresses, and the idea of effect and cause. When the winds of change are calm, then in Lord Shiva I worship. There is neither any in or out, he is perfect stillness of the mind. He is the one whom I worship. He whose thunderous laughter represents the great flood of knowledge. Knowledge, of course, is, uh, comes from consciousness. We have knowledge because we have consciousness of things. And uh, I think the word thunderous laughter is probably alluding back to his uh, identity as a storm deity at one point. He who dispels all darkness, from whom all darkness is dispelled, manifesting as white radiance, beauty like the pure white lotus. So his 
you know, many of the deities like Rama and Krishna are pictured as uh, somewhat blue casted and uh, Kali is blue black in color. But Shiva is represented as white in color. And uh, so that represents this, this pure luminous uh, oneness of thought. He is the one indivisible and in meditation he is sought, realized within the heart when one has obtained self-control. He destroys all sin and takes the stains, rids us of the stains of our age. Over us do his benign eyes watch when we surrender to him. Joyously we, he sacrificed himself for the good of others. For his throat is blue in color from drinking the poison meant for others. That alludes to the, the myth of the churning of the oceans where uh, the Amrita was lost in the ocean and so the devas and asuras had to cooperate by churning them back out of the ocean. And so they used a mountain for the pillar and a snake for the rope. And the snake kind of objected to that and started to vomit uh, venom. And so uh, Lord Shiva had to save the world from being uh, poisoned by the venom and he held it in his throat. Now uh, some people point out that Sri Ramakrishna took on many of the karmas of his disciples and died of throat cancer and they think there's a connection there. Lustrous as the white uh, water lily, him I salute. It seemed also that Sri Ramakrishna had uh, his realization of Shiva effortlessly. He had to work to, through sadhanas to uh, have his realizations in other traditions. But for Shiva, it came spontaneously when he was a very uh, young boy and asked to play the part in the Shiva drama before Shivaratri. And he b went into an ecstatic mood uh, and became still and motionless and the whole drama had to stop and the whole audience was transfixed on him, who, uh, Sri Ramakrishna, who, had been, uh, who became absorbed with his oneness in Shiva. So at a very young age, he had this effortless realization of Shiva. Even younger than that, his uh, nursemaid uh, reports that uh, he, she left him unattended for a short time and found that he'd rolled into the fireplace and gotten himself all covered in ashes, which of course is kind of a hallmark of Shiva. He is uh, depicted as the ash besmeared deity. Uh, so it's interesting that he has all of these uh, early connections. And of course his uh, father and mother both had uh, uh, predictive visions uh, before his birth. The father had a dream that he, that Lord Vishnu would be born as his son. And almost simultaneously, the wife had a vision of light streaming from the Shiva temple uh, that she was praying at and the light entering her womb and she became uh, pregnant. And so she uh, had this vision of Lord Shiva coming in uh, into her womb and being incarnated as Sri Ramakrishna. So there are lots of these connections between uh, Sri Ramakrishna and Shiva and this philosophy of Shaivism. Now Shaivism handles this philosophical conundrum of how do you get from a changeless reality to what we see in slightly different way than they do with Advaita Vedanta. Advaita Vedanta kind of emphasizes the uh, unreality of the world, that it's a, a mirage of some sort or uh, something that's uh, an apparition. In Shaivism, they emphasize that uh, Satchitananda has become everything. And of course, Sri Ramakrishna says this uh, many times, that everything has become in, uh, or is imbued with Satchitananda, has his consciousness, and he would see it that way. Uh, and so there's this idea that there's a vibration in the universe that causes us to see things with this multiplicity of, of objects. And so it's a vibration in consciousness. 
And so much like an instrument vibrates, but the instrument's still perfectly good, unless you're Beethoven and you pound on your piano so hard you break it. But most people, when they play an instrument, it vibrates and creates music, and it's still perfectly good afterwards. So similarly, Satchitananda vibrates with this spondo or this vibrational energy and creates uh, this a uh, music of, of manifestation, you could say. And so in the Shaivite uh, doctrine, especially Kashmir Shaivism, they emphasize this idea of the spanda or the vibration. Everything is filled with vibrations. And so this is why uh, we have mantras. The mantras are sound vibrations which uh, put us back into resonance with our ultimate reality. And we look at yantras and the pat geometric patterns vibrate with energy that put us back in touch with uh, our spiritual essence. And so everything in the universe is made up of vibrational energies. And since our true nature is one with that divine essence, our true nature has all of the right vibrations to uh, be in touch with the ultimate reality. So this is why we have uh, things like singing and uh, chanting and drumming and all sorts of all of those kinds of things that make sound because sound is the kind of vibration that we can relate to most easily. Uh, we can both create sound and receive sound. And you can even feel it sometimes if it's in the right vibrations, your body actually feels the vibration as well as your, your ears. So we're going to have a, a sound bath now. We have a set of crystal uh, bowls. The Tibetans, of course, were, are renowned for having uh, uh, metal bowls made out of very special metals and the ancient ones seem to be made out of a alloy that we're not quite sure how they did. We've tried to duplicate that but we're not quite as good at it as the ancient Tibetans were. But they've also discovered that these crystal bowls make a, a beautiful pure tone. So we have a, a lovely set here and uh, Lok can come forward now. So we're just going to invite you to uh, sit and relax and we're going to do a nice guided meditation as you are bathed in sound. So <clears throat> the idea is that the sound vibrations will be uh, help, uh, will be conducive to focusing on various spiritual aspects. And so we're going to <clears throat> Um, <clears throat> let you, you can just close your eyes and just start with some nice deep breaths and mentally think of Om as you breathe in and feel that there's an energy coming through your crown chakra and coming down the front of your body and then as you exhale, think of Om again and that that perhaps light energy is a good way to feel it. This light energy then goes up the spine. And we're, so we're doing this with OM first so that all of the uh, energy centers called chakras in the body will be nice and purified with the OM sound, which represents the sound symbol of Brahman being made up of the three syllables, A, ah, U, Um. Uh, representing the th whole spectrum of possible sounds. So take some nice deep breaths. And let's listen to the highest tone of the crystal bowl as we do this a few times.
now let's bring our focus down to the root chakra right at the base of the spine the muladhara chakra and continue to take nice deep regular breaths and you can still think of om sound as coming down through the top of the head and then as it comes down to the root the base of the spine think of the word lam lam so we go om on the in breath and lum as it reaches the root chakra and see that area glowing with a beautiful red light this symbolizes being rooted and grounded in mother earth We're still embodied beings and we need to stay rooted and we the most spiritual way to think of that is being rooted with the help of mother earth this beautiful red energy Let's move our consciousness up to the next chakra, the sacral chakra, a little bit further up the spine. And with the om and the in breath, let the energy then circle around through the root chakra up to the sacral chakra. And picture an orange light vibrating with vum so om vum that your creative energy and your ability to be adaptable and innovative are all being enhanced. up to the solar plexus area the Manipura chakra the navel center continuing with OM on the in breath circling back through the red and orange and now up through to the navel center and picture a yellow light vibrating with RUM is a power center and we want our power to be aligned with the highest spiritual vibration so that it's not misused in any way but used for the general good.
So we're creating a rainbow of colors as well as a spectrum of sound. And we're going to move up to the heart center, the Anahata Chakra. And it's a glowing with a green light with the sound of yum. Om on the in-breath, yum on the out-breath, going through the rainbow from red, orange, yellow to green in the heart center. Feel that that green energy is enhancing your universal love for all beings. The vibration of yum in the heart center is expanding feelings of peace and love towards all beings. This is the central chakra. We have three below that we spend most of our conscious time in and three above, which we would like to be able to spend our spiritual time in. And we'd like all of our chakras working in unified harmony. So with each step we are harmonizing and getting each chakra in resonance with the rest of the chakras. So we'll move on up to the throat chakra, the Fidshuddha chakra. The throat center has a Vija mantra of hum. So, Om on the in-breath, circling around through red, orange, yellow, green, blue into the throat center, like the blue throat of Lord Shiva. Hum.
being the throat center, it's associated with speech, sound, singing, chanting. And this helps to align all of those things with the highest spiritual vibration. Om Hum. Om Hum. Moving on to the third eye chakra, the Ajna chakra, located between the two eyebrows. And again, with the nice, deep, relaxing breaths, opening ourselves up to the spiritual vibrations. We think Om on the in-breath. And now we go all the way up through red, orange, yellow, green, blue, to violet in the third eye Ajna Chakra. This is the I-Thou relationship that's just you and the Lord. This violet, radiant energy is vibrating with the word Kshyam, K-S-H-A-M, Kshyam. Now we move up back to the crown chakra. So again with Om on the in-breath, Om on the out-breath coming up. We visualize a whole rainbow of colors. And the whole chakra system in resonance. Let's emphasize that resonance one by one. So let's take the crown chakra and the root chakra, and we'll hear those pitches together and feel that those are 
resonating spiritually together. top chakra and the second chakra. chakra and the third chakra, the solar plexus and the crown chakra. chakra and the heart chakra. chakra and the throat chakra. two chakras, the crown chakra and the third eye chakra. For the next few minutes, you can repeat your mantra, you can repeat Om, and we're going to hear a symphony of sounds all vibrating together.
Namada Purnamidam Purnat Purnamudachate Purnasya Purnamadaya Purnamivavashishate Om Shanti 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 Filled with Brahman are the things we see. Filled with Brahman are the things we see not. From out of Brahman floweth all that is. From Brahman all, yet is it still the same. Om, peace, peace, peace.